the, the field that we decided to do it in, the choice we made, was music. Now, why music? Well, we love music, and it's always good to do something you love. More importantly, music's a part of everyone's life. Everyone. Music's been around forever. It will always be around. This is not a speculative market. And because it's a part of everyone's life, it's a very large target market all around the world. It knows no boundaries. But interestingly enough, in this whole new digital music revolution, there is no market leader. There are small companies like Creative and Sonic Blue, and then there's some large companies like Sony that haven't had a hit yet. They haven't found the recipe. No one has really found the recipe yet for digital music. And we think not only can we find the recipe, but we think the Apple brand is going to be fantastic because people trust the Apple brand to get their great digital electronics from. So let's look at portable music. Let's look at the landscape. The first thing, if you want to listen to music portably, you can go out and buy a CD, uh, CD player. Right? That's one way to go, about 15, 10 to 15 songs. Or you can buy a flash player. Go out and buy one of those. You can buy a MP3 CD player, or you can buy a hard disk-based jukebox player. These are the four choices for portable music right now. So let's take a look at each one of those. A CD player costs about $75, holds 10 to 15 songs on a CD. That's about $5 a song. You can go buy a flash player, pay about double that, about $150, holds the same 10 to 15 songs, or about $10 a song. You can go buy an MP3 CD player, and an MP3 CD, uh, which you can burn on your computer, costs about $150, but holds 150 songs. So you get down to a dollar a song. Or you can go buy a hard drive jukebox player for about $300. It holds about 1,000 songs and costs about 30 cents a song. So we looked at this and studied all these, and that's where we want to be. That is where we want to be. And we are introducing a product today that takes us exactly there. And that product is called iPod. iMac, iBook, iPod. What is iPod? iPod is an MP3 music player, has CD quality music, and it plays all of the popular open formats of digital music, MP3, MP3 variable bitrate, uh, WAV, and AIFF. But the biggest thing about iPod is it holds a thousand songs. Now, this is a quantum leap because it's your, for most people, it's their entire music library. This is huge. How many times have you gone on the road with a CD player and said, oh, God, the CD, I didn't bring the CD I wanted to listen to? To have your whole music library with you at all times is a quantum leap in listening to music. The coolest thing about iPod is that whole, your entire music library fits in your pocket. Okay? You can take your whole music library with you right in your pocket. Never before possible. So that's iPod. There are three major breakthroughs in iPod. Let's take a look at each one of them. The first one is it's ultra portable. So if we're going to keep a thousand songs on iPod and it fits in your pocket, how, how do we do this? How do we possibly do this? Well, we start off with an ultra-thin hard drive. We've got a 1.8-inch diameter hard drive that's 0.2 inches thick, super thin. And that hard drive is 5 gigabytes in capacity, 5 gigabytes, which holds 1,000 songs at 160 kilobit rate, which is a very high-quality rate of MP3 compression. Very high quality. 1,000 songs on this 5 gigabyte drive. And we've built in 20 minute skip protection. That's not, tw that's not 20 seconds. 20 minute skip protection. So you can take iPod bicycling, mountain climbing, jogging, you name it. And you're not going to skip a beat. So we've got this 5 gigabyte drive that holds 1,000 songs. How do we get the 1,000 songs on to iPod? We don't want to wait. So we've built in FireWire. Now, Apple, as you know, invented FireWire. We should FireWire on every computer we make. It's built into iPod. It's the first and only music player with FireWire. Why? 
because it's fast. You can download an entire CD into iPod in five to 10 seconds, an entire CD. So let's take a look at how it compares with USB. Five to 10 seconds for FireWire to load a CD. On a USB player, you're talking five minutes. Let's talk about a thousand songs now. On iPod with FireWire, it is under 10 minutes. On a USB player, it is five hours. Can you imagine that? You get your USB player, you want to load a thousand songs, and you get to watch it for five hours while it loads the songs. Under 10 minutes with iPod. It's 30 times faster than any other MP3 player. So, huge win. Now, it doesn't matter how many songs you have with you if your battery's dead, right? So we have built in an extraordinary battery into iPod. 10 hours of battery life, and that is 10 hours of continuous music. We're using a rechargeable lithium polymer battery. This is a more advanced battery than we even use in our portable computers. It's the most advanced battery we've ever shipped. And you can recharge this 10 hour battery in one hour to 80% of its capacity on a fast charge. One hour. But maybe the coolest thing is that you know FireWire, the FireWire cable carries all the data from the Mac to iPod, but FireWire also has power on it. And so when you plug in to your Mac, it actually charges the iPod over that single FireWire cable. So you don't have another charging cable to worry about. It charges over FireWire every time you plug into your Mac. Now you might say, well, what happens if I'm on the road with my iPod and I didn't bring my Mac with me and my battery's running low? What do I do? Well, we got a really cool charger that ships as part of iPod, too. And this charger has a FireWire port on it. So you take your FireWire cable and just plug it right into the charger and plug it into the outlet and charge iPod wherever you happen to be where there's an outlet. So 10 hours of continuous music playback with a remarkable new battery technology. Now, you might be saying, well, this is cool. This is cool. but..." You know, I've got a big hard disk in my, my portable, let's say my iBook. I'm running iTunes. I'm really happy. I've got FireWire on my iBook. I don't quite get 10 hours of battery life, but iBook's got better, better battery life than any other consumer portable. So what's, what's so special about iPod here? It's ultra portable. An iBook is really portable, but this is ultra portable. <laughs> and let me show you what I mean. iPod is the size of a deck of cards a deck of cards. It is 2.4 inches wide, it is 4 inches tall, and it is barely over 3 quarters of an inch thick. This is tiny. It also only weighs six and a half ounces. That is lighter than most of the cell phones you have in your pockets right now. So this is what's so remarkable about iPod. It is ultra portable. We didn't stop there. iPod has got Apple design. We've got one of the best design teams in the world, and they have done a remarkable job. Uh, and let me show you. This is what iPod looks from the side. Again, about three quarters of an inch thick. I'm going to show you the back first because I'm in love with it. It's stainless steel. It's really, really durable. It's beautiful. And this is what the front of it looks like. Boom. That's iPod. I happen to have one right here in my pocket, matter of fact. <laughs> there it is, right there. So, this amazing little device holds a thousand songs, and it goes right in my pocket. This is our store. And the store is divided into four parts. The first quarter of the store has our home section with great home and education products and our pro section with all our great pro products. And every product we make is in this first 25% of the store. You can see the whole product line. And as you see up on the ceiling, we've even labeled the sections. Home, music, kids, genius on this side, and pro, movie, photos, and et cetera on this side. So the first 25% shows you our entire product line. Now there's 36 computers on display in the store. Every single one of them is connected to the internet. 
So you can go up to any computer and start surfing, go to your personal website, or do whatever you want to do on the internet. And all of our portables are connected with airport wireless networking, so you can experience that for yourself. It's pretty great. So come on over here, let me show you what we got going in the home section. <clears throat> Here's our newest iBook. We've got iBooks on display. Most of the products are running self-running demos, but you can just walk up to them and start using them for anything you like. And here we've got three iBooks on display, and we've got every single model of iMac we make as well. We've got our new PowerBook G4 Titaniums running here. Again, all running Mac OS X, all on airports, so you can just pick these up and see what it's really like to have wireless connection to the internet. And we've got every Power Mac we make here, along with all of our great displays, including the 22-inch cinema display. The center half of the store, literally half the store, is devoted to solutions because people don't just want to buy personal computers anymore. They want to know what they can do with them. And we're going to show people exactly that. And so we've got four sections. The solutions we've chosen to feature now are music, movies, photos, and kids. And so come on over here as an example. You can bring your kids into our store and they can just sit a spell, play their favorite games, and we have the best selection of Mac education software uh, that I've ever seen. And you can buy the best educational titles for your kids. We decided carrying our own products wasn't enough. So not only do we have over 300 software titles here that we'll look at in a minute, but we have 24 of the best portable digital devices. We're carrying six digital camcorders, six digital cameras, six MP3 players, and six handheld organizers. So if we look right in back of you here, we've got three Canons and three Sonys. So you can come in here and not only can you buy these digital devices, but you can actually hook them right up to the Macs and, and take them for a spin. Wouldn't it be great if when you went to buy a computer, or after you bought a computer, if you had any questions, you could ask a genius. Well, that's what we've got. This is called the Genius Bar. As you can see, we've got some pictures of our heroes up here. And this bar here, I'm not a genius, but I'll stand behind here. There'll be somebody here who can do service right in the store and who can answer any questions you've got about your Mac or about any of the peripherals or software that work with it. And if that person doesn't know the answer, they got a hotline to call us in Cupertino at Apple headquarters where we have somebody who does. And so we're hoping this is going to be an entirely new thing. We're so excited about this. We can't wait to let customers in the store. So let's walk through the software aisle in the middle. One last thing I want to show you is all our great software. Look at this stuff. We have over 300 titles here from games to the most sophisticated pro applications. There's something for everybody here. I'll see you when the store opens. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. And Apple has been, well, first of all, one's very fortunate if you get to work on just one of these in your career. Apple's been very fortunate. It's been able to introduce a few of these into the world. In 1984, we introduced the Macintosh. It didn't just change Apple. It changed the whole computer industry. In 2001, we introduced the first iPod. And it didn't just, it didn't just change the way we all listen to music. It changed the entire music industry. Well, today, we're introducing three 
revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, <laughs> and an internet communicator. An iPod, <laughs> a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. And here it is. <laughs> no. Actually, here it is, but we're going to leave it there for now. So, before we get into it, let me, uh, let me talk about a category of things. The most advanced phones are called smartphones, so they say. And uh, they typically combine a phone plus some email capability, plus they say it's the internet, sort of the baby internet into one device, and they all have these plastic little keyboards on them. Uh, and uh, the problem is that they're not so smart, and they're not so easy to use. So if you kind of make a you know, business school 101 graph of the smart axis and the easy to use axis, phones, regular cell phones are kind of right there. They're not so smart, and they're you know, not so easy to use. Um, but smartphones are definitely a little smarter, but they actually are harder to use. They're really complicated. Just for the basic stuff, people have a hard time figuring out how to use them. Well, we don't want to do either one of these things. What we want to do is make a LeapFrog product that is way smarter than any mobile device has ever been and super easy to use. This is what iPhone is. Okay? So. We're going to reinvent the phone. Now, we're going to start with a revolutionary user interface. It is the result of years of research and development. And of course, it's an interplay of hardware and software. Now, why do we need a revolutionary user interface? I mean, here's four smartphones, right? Motorola Q, the BlackBerry. Palm Treo, Nokia E62, the usual suspects. And what's wrong with their user interfaces? Well, the problem with them is really sort of in the bottom 40 there. It's, it's this stuff right here. They all have these keyboards that are there whether you need them or not to be there. And they all have these control buttons that are fixed in plastic and are the same for every application. Well, every application wants a slightly different user interface, a slightly optimized set of buttons just for it. And what happens if you think of a great idea six months from now? You can't run around and add a button to these things. They're already shipped. So what do you do? It doesn't work because the buttons and the controls can't change. They can't change for each application, and they can't change down the road if you think of another great idea you want to add to this product. Well, how do you solve this? Hmm. It turns out we have solved it. We solved it in computers 20 years ago. We solved it with a bitmap screen that could display anything we want, put any user interface up, and a pointing device. We solved it with the mouse, right? 
we solve this problem. So how are we going to take this to a mobile device? Well, what we're going to do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a giant screen. A giant screen. Now, how are we going to communicate this? We don't want to carry around a mouse, right? So what are we going to do? Oh, a stylus, right? We're going to use a stylus. No. <laughs> no. Who wants a stylus? You have to get them and put them away and you lose them. Yuck. Nobody wants a stylus. So let's not use a stylus. We're going to use the best pointing device in the world. We're going to use a pointing device that we're all born with. We're born with 10 of them. We're going to use our fingers. We're going to touch this with our fingers. And we have invented a new technology called multi-touch, which is phenomenal. It works like magic. You don't need a stylus. It's far more accurate than any touch display that's ever been shipped. It ignores unintended touches. It's super smart. You can do multi-finger gestures on it. And boy, have we patented it. <laughs> so, so, we've been very lucky to have brought a few revolutionary user interfaces to the market in our time. First was the mouse. The second was the click wheel. And now we're going to bring multi-touch to the market. And each of these revolutionary user interfaces has made possible a revolutionary product. The Mac, the iPod, and now the iPhone. So a revolutionary user interface. We're going to build on top of that with software. Now, software on mobile phones is like, it's like baby software. It's not so powerful. And today, we're going to show you a software breakthrough, software that's at least five years ahead of what's on any other phone. Now, how do we do this? Well, we start with a strong foundation. iPhone runs OS X. Yeah. Now, why, why would we want to run such a sophisticated operating system on a mobile device? Well, because it's got everything we need. It's got multitasking. It's got the best networking. It already knows how to power manage. We've been doing this on mobile computers for years. It's got awesome security. And to write apps, it's got everything from Coco and the graphics, and it's got core animation built in. And it's got the audio and video that OS X is famous for. It's got all the stuff we want. And it's built right in to iPhone. And that has let us create desktop class applications and networking. Right? Not the crippled stuff that you find on most phones. This is real desktop class applications. Now, you know, one of the pioneers of our industry, Alan Kay, has had a lot of great quotes throughout the years. And I ran across one of them recently that explains how we look at this, explains why we go about doing things the way we do, because we love software. And here's the quote. People who are really serious about software should make their own hardware. You know? Alan said this 30 years ago. And this is how we feel about it. And so we're bringing breakthrough software to a mobile device for the first time it's five years ahead of anything on any other phone. The second thing we're doing is we're learning from the iPod, syncing with iTunes. You know, we're going to ship our 100 millionth iPod this year, and that's a, tens of millions of people that know how to sync these devices with their PCs or Mac and sync all of their media right onto their iPod, right? So you just drop your iPod in, and it automatically syncs. You're going to do the same thing with iPhone. It automatically syncs to your PC or Mac right through iTunes. And iTunes is going to sync all your media onto your iPhone, your music, your audiobooks, podcasts, movies, TV shows, music videos. But it also syncs a ton of data. Your contacts, your calendars, and your photos, which you can get on your iPod today, your notes, your, your bookmarks from your web browser, your email accounts, your whole email setup, all that stuff can be moved over to iPhone completely automatically. It's really nice. And we do it, we do it through iTunes. 
Again, you go to iTunes and you set it up, just like you'd set up an iPod or an Apple TV. And you set up what you want synced to your iPhone. And it's just like an iPod. Charge and sync. So sync with iTunes. Third thing I want to talk about a little is design. We've designed something wonderful for your hand. Just wonderful. And this is what it looks like. It's got a three and a half inch screen on it. It's really big. And it's the highest resolution screen we've ever shipped. It's 160 pixels per inch. Highest we've ever shipped. It's gorgeous. And on the front, there's only one button down there. We call it the home button. It takes you home from wherever you are. And that's it. Let's take a look at the side. It's really thin. It's thinner than any smartphone out there at 11.6 millimeters. Thinner than the Q, thinner than the Blackjack, thinner than all of them. It's really nice. And we've got some controls on the side. We've got a little switch for ring and silent. We've got a volume up and down control. Let's look at the back. On the back, the biggest thing of note is we've got a 2 megapixel camera built right in. The other side, and we're back on the front. So let's take a look at the top now. We've got a headset jack, 3.5 millimeter. All your iPod headphones fit right in. We've got a place, a little tray for your SIM card. And we've got one switch for sleep and wake. Just push it to go to sleep, push it to wake up. Let's take a look at the bottom. We've got a speaker. We've got a microphone. And we've got our 30-pin iPod connector. So that's the bottom. Now, we've also got some stuff you can't see. We've got three really advanced sensors built into this phone. The first one is a proximity sensor. It senses when physical objects get close. So when you bring iPhone up to your ear to take a phone call, it turns off the display and it turns off the touch sensor instantly. Well, why do you want to do that? Well, one, to save battery, but two, so you don't get spurious inputs from your face into the touch screen. Just automatically turns them off, take it away, boom, it's back on. So it's got a proximity sensor built in. It's got an ambient light sensor as well. We sense the ambient lighting conditions and adjust the brightness of the display to match the ambient lighting conditions. Again, better user experience saves power. And the third thing we've got is an accelerometer so that we can tell when you switch from portrait to landscape. Use laptops and smartphones now. Everybody uses a laptop and or a smartphone. And the question has arisen lately. Is there room for a third category of device in the middle? Something that's between a laptop and a smartphone. And of course, we've pondered this question for years as well. The bar is pretty high. In order to really create a new category of devices, those devices are going to have to be far better at doing some key tasks. They're going to have to be far better at doing some really important things, better than the laptop, better than the smartphone. What kind of tasks? Well, things like browsing the web. That's a pretty tall order. Something that's better at browsing the web than a laptop? OK. Doing email. Enjoying and sharing photographs. Video, watching videos. Enjoying your music collection. Playing games, reading ebooks. If there's going to be a third category of device, it's going to have to be better at these kinds of tasks than a laptop or a smartphone. Otherwise, it has no reason for being. Now, some people have thought that that's a netbook. The problem is, netbooks aren't better at anything. <laughs> they they're slow, they have low quality displays, and they run clunky old PC software. So they're not better than a laptop at anything, they're just cheaper. They're just cheap laptops. And we don't think that they're a third category device. But we think we've got something that is. And we'd like to show it to you today for the first time. And we call it the iPad. So, let me show it to you now. What it looks like, 
I happen to have one right here. That's what it looks like. Very thin. It's just like this. So, just give you a little overview. It's very thin. And you can uh, change the background screen, the home screen, to personalize it any way you want. People put their own photos on it, I'm sure, but we ship a few and you can make it anything you want. And what this device does is extraordinary. You can browse the web with it. It is the best browsing experience you've ever had. It's phenomenal to see a whole web page right in front of you and you can manipulate with your fingers. It's unbelievably great. Way better than a laptop. Way better than a smartphone. And you can turn iPad any way you want. Up, down, sideways, it automatically adjusts however you want to use it. And again, to see the whole web page is phenomenal. Right there, holding the internet in your hands. It's an incredible experience. Phenomenal for mail. You want to focus in on a message, you can do that. See your inbox. Again, just turn iPad sideways. Get a different view on your mail. Push the Compose window. A keyboard pops up that's almost life-size. It's a dream to type on. For photos, your albums are shown as stacks of photos. Your albums are events. You can unfold them. Look at all your photos, flick through them, got some great slideshows built in. It's a wonderful way to share your photos with friends and family. Built in a calendar, you can see your month's activities or your day's activities and everything in between. Built in a great address book for your contacts. Have a great maps application which works with Google's back end. Show you maps, satellite views, zoom in on things iPad is an awesome way to enjoy your music collection. And, of course, we have the iTunes Store. Built right into the iPad, so you can discover music, you can purchase it. Movies, TV shows, podcasts, iTunes University, everything built right into the iPad. YouTube. You can watch YouTube on it, including YouTube in high def now. They've got a lot of high-def video. And, of course, it's awesome to watch TV shows and movies on. So that gives you a little overview of what the iPad can do. But it's nothing like seeing it. So I'd love to show it to you now. Let's take a look at it. Again, using this thing is remarkable. It's it's so much more intimate than a laptop, and it's so much more capable than a smartphone with this gorgeous large display. So, let's get back to iPhone. In 2007, iPhone reinvented what we think of as a phone. It's hard to remember what it was like before iPhone. <laughs> Carriers controlled what was on the phone, there were a few apps, but nothing like we think about apps today. There was no free market for apps. There was no app store. It was really different before the iPhone. And the iPhone started to change all of that in 2007. It was a revolution. In 2008, we added 3G networking and the app store. In 2009, the iPhone 3GS was twice as fast and we added some other cool features, like video recording. For 2010, we're going to take the biggest leap since the original iPhone. And so today, today, we're introducing iPhone 4, the fourth generation iPhone. Now, this is really hot. And there are, there are 
well over 100 new features, and we don't have time to cover all of them today. So I get to cover eight of them with you. Eight new features of the iPhone 4. The first one, an all-new design. Now, stop me if you've already seen this. <laughs> Believe me, you ain't seen it. <laughs> you've got to see this thing in person. It is one of the most beautiful designs you've ever seen. This is, beyond a doubt, the most precise thing, one of the most beautiful things we've ever made. Glass on the front and the rear, and stainless steel running around, and the precision of which this is made is is beyond any consumer product we've ever seen. Its closest kin is like a beautiful old Leica camera. It's unheard of in consumer products today. Just gorgeous. And it's really thin. This is the new iPhone 4. It is just 9.3 millimeters thick. That is 24% thinner than the iPhone GS. Again, a quarter thinner in something you didn't think could get any thinner. As a matter of fact, it is the thinnest smartphone on the planet. So let me point out, let me point out a few of the things, uh, a few of the external things on it. Here are the volume controls, volume up, volume down, and mute. On the front, we have a front-facing camera. We have the receiver. We have the home button. We have the micro SIM tray. We have a camera and an LED flash on the back. If we look at the bottom, we've got the microphone, the 30-pin connector, and the speaker. And if we look on the top, We've got the headset jack. We've got a second mic for noise cancellation and the sweet sleep wake button. Now, because there have been a few photos of this around, people have asked, what's this? <laughs> Some have even said, this doesn't seem like Apple. What are these lines? in this beautiful stainless steel band. Well, it turns out there's not just one of them, there's three of them. And they are part of the entire structure of this phone. That stainless steel band that runs around is the primary structural element of the phone. And there are these three slits in it. It turns out this is part of some brilliant engineering which actually uses the stainless steel band as part of the antenna system. And so one piece is Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and GPS, and the other is UMTS and GSM. So it's got these integrated antennas right in the structure of the phone. It's never been done before. And it's really cool engineering. So. We have an all-new design. It's the thinnest smartphone ever. It uses stainless steel for strength. It uses glass on the front and the back for optical quality and scratch resistance. It's got integrated antennas and extraordinary build quality. Again, I don't think there's another consumer product like this. When you hold this in your hands, it's unbelievable. So this is our all-new design for the iPhone 4. That's the first one. Second one. This is a biggie. Something we call the retina display. What's that? Well. In any display, there are pixels. Here's four of them. 
We start off with the retina display by dramatically increasing the pixel density. Four times as many pixels in the same amount of space. Now, why is that important? Well, let's make more pixels. And let's say we want to draw the letter A. And this is the outside boundary of one of the strokes of a letter, the letter A. Well, as you can see, we turn on pixels inside that stroke. We can get far more precision the more pixels we have. And we play all sorts of tricks by putting different levels of gray pixels on that line as well to try to fuzz it for our eye. But when we zoom out of this, what you can see is that because we have four times as many pixels, we get really, really sharp text compared to what we normally get on displays of lesser resolution. Now, the retina display has 326 pixels per inch. This is. There's never been a display like this on a phone. People haven't even dreamed about a display like this on a phone. But it's more than that. It turns out that there's a magic number right around 300 pixels per inch that when you hold something around 10 or 12 inches away from your eyes is the limit of the human retina to differentiate the pixels. And so they're so close together when you get at this 300 pixels per inch threshold that all of a sudden things start to look like continuous, continuous curves. Like text looks like you've seen it in a fine printed book, unlike you've ever seen on an electronic display before. And at 326 pixels per inch, we are comfortably over that limit. And it's extraordinary. So let me give you an example of a normal display on the left and the retina display on the right. Look at the difference. Can you see it? Here's some more text of different sizes and different weights. You can really, really see this stuff. Once you use a retina display, you can't go back. <laughs> when you get to character-based languages, kanji in this case, it's also striking. And it's not just text. It's images and video as well. Look at the difference. This is the same image on a normal display and a retina display. Here's another one. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So what I'd like to do now is show this to you live.